Singaporeans want policy leadership that will help them to move away from the PAP's immigration-centered solution for the economy and bring back on track improvements to our standard of living. Hence, it's only appropriate this May Day, one year since the last general elections and the convening of Singapore's 12th Parliament in October 2011, that we review the PAP policy responses to the effects of rising costs and depressed wages. The question to ask is, have the PAP's efforts to address the issue of rising costs and depressed wages been effective? Our review, based on an analysis of PAP statements, media reports, and parliamentary debates, as well as insights generated from focus group discussions organized by the SDP's policy unit and feedback from our ground interactions show that the fundamental problem with the PAP's attempts to remedy the current hardships faced by Singaporeans is the PAP's own inability to move out of its old policy paradigm. I believe policy revisions based on these three fundamentals of a minimum wage, a streamlined social safety system, and the Singaporean first policy can remedy the current difficulties faced by many Singaporeans. This is the new policy direction we need for a better Singapore. Contrary to the view held by the PAP that the Singaporeans' basic needs have been met, the reality is many Singaporeans are now in a position where basic needs like education, health, housing, transport cannot be adequately met because of rising costs and depressed wages. The desperate need of many young families to have a double income in order to pay the bills have resulted in mothers returning to the workforce soon after their children were born with very little time for bonding. Care of the children are often left to strangers, such as domestic helpers or childcare centres. So many mothers in Singapore have actually very little control of how their child is being influenced, or how they are treated, or even how they are fed. These responsibilities become that of the childcare centre or the maids. First, if mothers have to leave the care of their children to other people, then how do we ensure that these other people are the right people to care for our children? The childcare industry is one of the lowest paying industry. If you and I truly believe that the first five years of a person's lives are the most important in terms of establishing foundations, then why is it that the people engage in this important task of engaging the foundations in our children's life are actually paid so poorly among teachers? My next question, if being a parent is not an easy task, then what kind of help can we extend to young mothers? Sure, we give them childcare leave, what else can we do for them? Even though there may be generous childcare subsidies and childcare leave granted, the insufficient earnings of one spouse in the family have forced women to return to the workforce to help support the family. inflation is now 5.2%. 5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,5.2%,
、水电费和医药费。新加坡有 ERB， 有 COE， 有 GRC， 拢种世界第一个，拢种世界无个。大学爱第一就对了。这组呢，现在呢，我们真的得到第一名了，精神病得到第一名了。现在我们每个人都知道，我们的压力太大了，压力跟 OCD 有密切的关系，有密切的关系。压力除了给你 OCD。还会给你很多其他的病，使到我们很容易生病了。We become very easy to fall ill because of stress, and because we fall ill easily, we need to have a good healthcare system, affordable, universal, and sustainable. These are the three qualities of a good healthcare system. The three M: MediSafe, 保健储蓄 ；MediShield, 健保双全 ；MediFund, 保健基金啊，基基金。他们只替我们付了十亿，少过十八千，少过十八千。这就是说。Three M 已经无效了。The Three M system is no longer effective. So, my friends, let us reflect on where we are heading. We reflect on where we are heading and whether this is the right thing to do. This is the right direction that Singapore should take. Under the circumstances that we are in, we are a small nation. We were doing well in 1990s. Where they concentrated on high-tech industries, value-added industries. What happened to that policy? I, I just don't know. Because that policy, you don't need a lot of labor. Singaporeans can improve their productivity by using high-quality machines to produce goods for the world. Not to do the easy way by having labor-intensive industries, just like the early days when we first started. So this policy is wrong, and it has to be changed. And the PAP will not change until you change them. The SDP health plan was put together by a team of dedicated doctors and a couple of health economists. It calls for universal, mandatory health insurance with a co-payment for those who can afford it. There is also a cap of two thousand dollars a year on the amount an individual has to pay. The Ministry of Health seems to like our plan because they haven't come up with any criticism in the last one and a half months since the plan was announced. We propose this plan because we see patients every day. Who struggle to cope with their medical bills? Not special privileges for the talented one percent. While we do not grudge the one percent their success, their nice homes, their fancy cars, we simply ask that they ing sui su yen and recognize the source of their wealth. To paraphrase Elizabeth Warren, the U.S. Senate candidate for Massachusetts. There is nobody in Singapore who got rich on his or her own efforts. Nobody. You became a big developer, built a high-tech trading company. Good for you. Our taxes, our income tax, our GST, our COE, our ERP, paid for the schools that trained your workers, your technicians, your engineers. They provided the safety and security from the police and civil defence and army. Your, our taxes paid to protect your investments, your good factories, your businesses, and the companies that make you wealthy. 
You had a great idea and became wealthy. God bless you. But do not forget the underlying social contract. Keep the bulk of it by all means. But never forget the workers who made you rich. Teachers and pupils should approach learning as a communal activity. Books only contain information. It is only when we discuss the information openly that it evolves into knowledge. At a previous time in our development, this factory production format of educating our young, training them as skilled workers for industry, was the need of the moment. Today, it is not. Instead, we need to equip our children with the ability to think critically and innovatively, generating ideas that are novel and of value, to prepare them for the challenges of living in a globalized and un an uncertain world. This age is a new age, and the task before us is to guide our young to higher and higher levels of creativity, and therefore productivity. We are constantly reminded of what a small country and vulnerable economy Singapore is. Our meritocratic education system is necessary to harness and fully maximize our talents. But to maximize the one is not to diminish the other. As a community, our responsibility is to each and every child. I am utterly convinced that academic performance is not the only indicator of intelligence. We need a variety of skills, interests, and ideas to see Singapore through the years ahead. All these need to be explored in, and nurtured in our young, both within and outside the academic framework. Students who are not academically inclined should still have access to the best teachers and learning resources so that they too have an equal opportunity to achieve their potential. Teachers must not only believe these individuals can exceed their own expectations, but must inspire them to believe it too. As a nation, we must inspire our teachers to continue to do so. We are 51 weeks from the most devastating election from the point of view of the PAP. Now, during the campaign, you will remember, we saw tears, we saw apologies, we saw appeals for servant leadership. And then from somewhere in Tanjung Paga, we were told that we would repent of our vote. But then after the elections, we heard promises, all sorts of promises. And now, 51 weeks away, we are able to look at what has happened. The obscene salaries of our cabinet ministers have been reduced but by a minuscule amount. Inflation is up again this quarter and it's predicted to go up in the last two quarters of this year. Jobs are down. In fact, today's papers say that uh, unemployment is up and the increase in jobs uh, has reduced. And in any case, a large proportion of the jobs that were created have gone not to Singaporeans, but to uh, temporary migrants. We also see transport prices having gone up, taxi fares. And just three weeks, three months after the election, we saw uh, an increase in bus fares. And in this quarter, we've seen an increase in the COE of up to almost $100,000. The PM, he now has a Facebook page so he can communicate with us. But I think, I think the phrase is, he is being economical with the truth. He has not told us the situation that is happening in Singapore, the situation that you and I are experiencing, that we see in our streets and in our homes and in our workplaces. I'll just go back up, up to February of this year when the budget was published. And the SDP published its shadow budget. And I was criticized for calling it a populist budget. Now, I make no apology for the use of that word. Aggregate spending in the budget on human well-being has not increased by any measure. 
healthcare, which was said to be going up by $4 billion, actually amounts to $14 per person over that period of time. Now, what have we seen that has increased? Defence spending yet again. Billions placed on our defence budget to protect us against non-existent enemies. While, as I said during the general election, we prepare for war, our children are being prepared for a lacklustre future. And that is a concern that all of us need to take very, very seriously. Investment in the new economy, investment in uh, harnessing the skills of our young people figured nowhere in Taman's budget. And so my friends, a budget that pretends to reallocate resources so as to pretend to address the concerns that we raised during the elections is a populist budget and the government needs to know that.